Our dinner speaker, Joe Stiglitz, needs no introduction here, but I want to touch on some of, some of the highlights. Um, before that, uh, I want to comment that he's an Amherst man, like me, and um, he's been a great friend of mine for many years, I suspect, than we can count. Um, and he was an early member of the center in 2001, the same year he joined the faculty at Columbia. He has spoken several times at our conferences, and I'm very glad he agreed to speak here tonight. Joe has walked an impressive path. I'll note some of the mines, milestones, not that it's necessary. He's held senior positions at the World Bank and was chairman, I know that means chair, uh, of the Council of Economic Advisors. He received the Nobel Prize in Economics 2001 with George Akerlof and Michael Spence for their analyses of markets with asymmetric information. Over the years, he has worked on a wide range of topics, including income distribution, asymmetric risk, corporate governance, public policy, macroeconomics, and globalization. Among his many books, one is People, Power, and Profits, Another is rewriting the rules of the European economy. And still another is globalization and its discontents revisited. The floor is you. The floor is yours, Joe. Thank you, thank you, Nat, and it's a real pleasure to be here uh, again. Um, the uh, I think the center's emphasis on on capitalism and society, not just the economy, is absolutely uh, crucial. And I'm going to talk uh, a lot about uh, that uh, more broad view uh, of what do we mean by a good society um, and what kind of of economy uh, delivers a good society. Uh, but before I get in, in and, and those of you who know me know uh, probably the answer before I give it. Yeah, some of you could probably give the uh, speech for me, so maybe I should just sit down. Um, I think neoliberal capitalism does not deliver a good society. Uh, it delivers the antithesis of a good society. But I think... Uh, um, any decentral, any large modern economy has to be decentralized. So it has to be a market economy. I'll come back to that. But it has to be a very different kind of market economy than the kind of market economy um, that we've had in the last 40 years. But before I get uh, there, I wanted to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, Ned and my long-term friendship uh, with uh, Ned. Um, maybe where I should begin is, is where Partha began, which was reading the paper on the Golden Rule, which all of us did as students. Really a, a beautiful paper that, that very elegantly presents a very, very deep idea. Um, I think is one of the things that it made it, uh, I was already a graduate student, and so I was glad that I had chosen uh, to become uh, an economist. And it, it is really a, a beautiful paper. Um, I was going to mention, um, uh, you know, w that, that uh, one of the things that Ned has always done is gone beyond standard uh, economics. And uh, Ned mentioned that we've, we both went to uh, Amherst uh, College, and that's related to uh, the talk uh, we had at lunch, that we're both part of the same kingship uh, circle, um, that there is something about 
having gone to Amherst College and, and shared those experiences. But one aspect of, of Amherst was that uh, it was a liberal arts college that emphasized these broader views. We all had to take philosophy. Uh, we all, it, it was sort of, I took uh, as an economics major only three semesters of economics. The rest was in literature and in, in history and in philosophy and mathematics. Um, so, you know, I, I think it may have given both Ned and I uh, a, a different perspective on economics and, and where we, we thought uh, the field ought to go. Um, those of you who know Ned know that uh, one aspect of, uh, of culture that Ned is very fond of is music, in particular uh, singing. And um, one of the things, I don't know if Ned remembers, Ned and I are probably the, uh, I don't know how many of you know about this Spolito Music Festival. Uh, it's a great music festival in Italy. And I think Ned and I are probably two of the only economists who have performed uh, in, uh, in Spoleto. Um, but I should say, it was a moment where uh, the music festival thought it needed to round itself out by having uh, some more general discussions going beyond music. So while Ned could have performed, I, I, it's not my thing. And, uh, but Ned gave, uh, at that Spolito con uh, conference, a beautiful paper, uh, which I remember to that day, it must have been 15 years ago, which was about art and economics and how uh, trends in art uh, may have uh, be mirrored, uh, realism and abstraction and very, by, by trends in economics. I'm not sure it was ever published. Um, you, he, had, he doesn't remember. Uh, I'm not sure it's correct, but it was a really interesting idea that I've, I've uh, thought a lot uh, about since. Let me just uh, share one more uh, experience that Ned and I had together. Um, many of you uh, may know, some of you, uh, that Ned has uh, had a lot of uh, good students uh, here at Columbia, uh, elsewhere too, but, but here at Columbia, um, very devoted uh, students. Uh, and uh, some of them uh, very successful students, uh, and some of them very successful not just in economics, but in making money, um, or inherited it, which is, uh, they chose the right parents, which I think is another great achievement. So, uh, um, and one, I don't know, again, uh, uh, of his great uh, students was Dr. Park, uh, who uh, owned the ASEAN Airlines and, and some other Kumo um, uh, um, uh, one of the Chaibol in Korea. So one of the times we were together in Seoul for the Econometric Society meetings, uh, Dr. Park invited Ned, me, and Ken Arrow to one of those um, uh, uh, places where you uh, have dinner with uh, uh, four people, and uh, you know, the four of us together, and eight. Uh, geisha girls, but they weren't geisha girls. <laughs> they were uh, uh, eight people who who uh, present. It, it was very. It was not PC, and and we probably shouldn't admit that. But it was before that. Uh, uh, that um, and uh, as today, at the end of those meals, uh, you're supposed to do karaoke. <laughs> and um, the story's not getting better. <laughs> But uh, Ned loves karaoke, so it was, uh, uh, Ned was in his uh, uh, um, in an environment that he really loved, um, and uh, I may have many strengths, but singing is not one of them, as my children will tell you. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Ned uh, nudged me up to uh, do karaoke, 
Well, fortunately, it was only in front of Ken Arrow, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, and Dr. Park, so I, 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 I didn't, it wasn't very embarrassing. And I don't know if you remember, you, it was also a Mio that we had to sing. Um, anyway, it was, it was a, a memorable uh, evening. Well, um, uh, so that's all part of a good society, uh, but it had a little bit too much inequality. Uh, but a, a nice aspect of the inequality in Korea, I mean, I shouldn't say it, not, is that it was all very private as opposed to the kind of public inequality that we have uh, here in America. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to talk about inequality. I'm going to talk about, uh, first, as I say, what, some conceptual ideas about what we might mean by a, a good society and the relationship between economics and a good society, and then as some general principles, and then uh, talk about uh, what kind of economy delivers on a good society. So I'll begin with a, just a few simple ideas that I think most of you would agree with. And the first is that the economy is supposed to serve society, not the other way around. However we mean serving society, it, 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 sometimes um, one gets the feeling that, that uh, you know, workers should accept lower wages in order to make our, society, our economy work better. Um, even if they, the end, are, are worse off. So the first is the economics should serve, uh, the economy should serve society. The second is that, um, that is that uh, in uh, thinking about serving society, uh, what we really should mean is helping create a good society. And uh, by that, one means going beyond what economists always talk about, Pareto efficiency, uh, that may be uh, a necessary condition, but it's certainly not a sufficient condition. And uh, you know, much of my, my earlier work and, and some of Ned's uh, was trying to point out that the market economy actually, without appropriate regulations, is not Pareto efficient. Um, but it's more than that. Um, some of uh, Neg's earlier work was uh, thinking about what is meant by a fair and just society. Uh, if you get his uh, newest book, not the one that's about to come out, but his last book, where he, his memoir, he talks about uh, his time at uh, the Institute for Vance, uh, uh, at, at Stanford, and uh, the uh, influence of Rawlsian economic, of Rawlsian philosophy uh, during that period. And he, it gave rise to a number of papers about what is a, uh, a just tax system from the perspective of Rawls. Um, ideas about thinking about justice uh, behind the veil of ignorance. Uh, uh, uh. The um, in his more recent work, uh, Ned has emphasized uh, uh, valuing uh, creativity, dynamism. Uh, but there's a whole strand of, of work that I'm going to come to uh, refer to very briefly uh, uh, later, which is that while standard economics assumes that individuals are born with well-formed preferences, uh, in fact, uh, as uh, was brought up several times today, people, uh, parents, we, as parents, we work very hard to try to shape our children. Uh, the education is engaged in trying to shape uh, children. Uh, and you wouldn't do that if you didn't think preferences were, to some extent, or endogenous. And um, that means we have to think about, first of all, it means the whole I, framework of Pareto efficiency really doesn't apply. Pareto efficiency only works as a concept, construct when preferences are fixed. And once we go on to a world where preferences are endogenous, we have to ask really the hard questions about what we mean by a good society and what we mean by good people that is to say, a good society we would think of as creating good people. And I'm not going to be able to, to defend uh, you know, uh, what I'm going to say now, but I think, I, I think most of us would agree that 
uh, attributes like honesty, trust, um, valuing creativity are all attributes that we think of as attributes uh, of uh, good individuals that would be created by a good society. And to get a little bit ahead of the story, it's very clear that our economy or our society has been creating some individuals who are not exemplar in those characteristics, including one that served as president of the United States. And uh, I would argue that it's not an, ac a, 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 an accident. It, it is a, a, an inherent part of, of the system. So that's the second point I wanted to emphasize. And third is that among the attributes of, of a good society are, are ideas like freedom, um, part of individual freedom, uh, indiv ex individual expression. But the the agenda of freedom has been captured by the extreme right, by the Freedom Caucus. And what I want to argue a little bit tonight is that um, that agenda of freedom needs to be recaptured, that uh, they have misunderstood what freedom means. And uh, in a way, I, I, that could get ref uh, Isaiah Berlin, who was uh, a great ph philosopher of the last century, put it, I thought, much better than most economists do um, when he said, uh, freedom for the wolves is death for the sheep. Um, we, we as economists put it more prosaically saying there are externalities. <laughs> if you don't wear a mask or you don't get a vaccine, other people may die. Uh, if your freedom to carry an AK-47 re reflects a risk of somebody else's uh, loss of the right to love life. And that means from a societal point of view, if we're thinking about a good society, we have to make trade-offs. We're always making those trade-offs as a society. It's not absolute freedom. Uh, it's it, it's trade-offs. Um, but in the examples I just gave, I think it's obvious that most reasonable people would say that the inconvenience of wearing a mask and that loss of freedom is much less important than somebody's loss of life. So um, if there is that trade-off uh, in the way I describe, it's very clear how a good society uh, would uh, make uh, those trade-offs. The, um, one of the things that, that uh, has changed in economics over uh, the last uh, 50 years is that uh, 50 years ago, externalities were relegated to the end of a, a textbook, a uh, principles textbook, and you never got to them. And uh, they were second order. Uh, yeah, they're a little wrinkle. You say, okay, yes, we, 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 we have to deal with externalities. And, and then there'd be a, some reference to uh, Pagu, and you say you, you have uh, corrective taxation. And that's the end of the story. But uh, what's happened now is the externalities have moved to, I think, the center of the stage. They are first order importance. Climate change is the most important uh, example, but pandemics are public health externality, and they're also positive externalities. Um, you know, Ned talks about innovation, dynamism. There are enormous uh, positive externalities from uh, those kinds of, of uh, uh, economic uh, activities. Um, one of the things that was referred to uh, in the sessions was importance of uh, trust in our society. And if people behave badly, dishonestly, uh, there is an erosion of trust. And that is an externality. Uh, the degree of trust in society is, is like a public good. And uh, there can be an erosion of, of, of that. Um, one of the things, uh, my work with, with uh, Bruce Greenwald, uh, 
show that whenever there are uh, imperfections of information, asymmetries of information, or incomplete risk markets, that is always, there are pecuniary externalities become important and that markets are not efficient. Another corollary of all of this uh, strand of work in economics is also that corrective taxation is part of the solution, but only part. You need regulations, you need, you need uh, um, nonlinear uh, interventions, uh, public investment. So, so that the simplistic view of Pagu that you could just have a corrective tax and that one sentence was all that you needed to know about externalities was wrong. So um, the point that uh, I want to make is that once we recognize that one person's freedom is another person's unfreedom, uh, that uh, you cannot avoid the issue of these trade-offs, and the naive discussion of being a freedom party is really silly. Uh, in some sense, the recognition of this uh, is part of, uh, you know, goes back thousands of years. The Ten Commandments is a set of regulations. Uh, it said that you cannot steal my property. That was a regulation, it was a restriction on the behavior of the thief. We take it for granted because it seems so obvious that we want to stop the thief from stealing uh, our property. But it was a trade-off between the freedom of the, of the thief and the, th the freedom uh, of the rights of the property owner. And, and uh, that's true of thou shalt not kill or you know, the, uh, many of the other of the Ten Commandments. So our society, uh, organized society, is based on regulations and a recognition that there are externalities and there are these trade-offs in freedoms. But um, the um, one aspect of, uh, I, I, I've talked about one, uh, a critical aspect of freedom, which is the freedom to do harm, but there's a broader way of looking at notions of freedom, which is uh, the freedom to act, the freedom to do, including the freedom to live up to your potential. If you don't have, somebody without any resources really doesn't have any freedom to act. He does what he can to survive. That's not freedom. And so that, um, that means we, we, even the issue of redistribution needs to be thought through through this lens, I think, of yes, you're taking away the freedom of somebody that you tax, but you're expanding the freedom to act of other individuals. And the question is, how do you evaluate those? Now, some people would say that the individual who you're taxing, say a wealthy individual, um, you know, put aside the instrumental issues about whether that has adverse incentive effects, but that he has a moral claim to that income. And I think that's, uh, the grounds for that, I think, are very weak. And that's, they're weak for two reasons. First of all, uh, most uh, of our endowments um, are uh, either a result of luck. You know, um, I knew a, a wealthy person who, who talked about his children winning in the sperm bank, the sperm lottery. And that is to say, he, you know, th th they show, he, he, they, he, that was just uh, uh, the luck of, of uh, who, who his parents were. But the, 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 the notion, um, you know, the, the, uh, as I said before, we don't choose our parents. There's, there's always that element of luck. And if you have an inheritance, uh, that's an element of luck. But uh, it's even more, um, a lot of the wealth in the advanced countries is attributable to exploitation, at least to some degree. Uh, you know, more than half the wealth in the United in the southern part of the United States was slavery. 
uh, the slaves accounted for more than 50% of the value of the wealth at the time of, of the South at the time of the Civil War. Um, tomorrow there's a lecture here at uh, Columbia by Amitabh Ghosh where he documents uh, the extent to which the opium trade gave rise to a lot of the wealth uh, in the United States. Um, and you go through modern, modern versions. Yes, uh, you may say there's some creativity of Gates, but he engaged in anti-competitive behavior in, uh, that was, you know, he found guilty of anti-competitive behavior in Europe, the United States, and, and Asia. So, yes, he, he should have gotten something for his creativity, but how much? If we believe in competitive markets, it's hard to believe that it would be anywhere near corresponding to what he got. Um, and the same thing, we can go through the other uh, 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 wealthy individuals. Um, some of them, like Sackler, have engaged in, in even worse forms of exploitation, which get reflected in a macroeconomic consequence of declining life expectancy in the United States. I mean, there aren't many individuals who can claim, or families, that can claim of success of changing a macroeconomic variable like the average life expectancy of a country. It's really an achievement in a way, but uh, it garnered for them uh, billions of dollars. So, um, the, uh, the first point I want to make is that there are questions about the moral legitimacy of m not all, but at least much of the wealth or some of the wealth. And secondly, since in general equilibrium, the returns on factors, on savings, on wages, are themselves a function of the distribution of asset endowments, those factor returns themselves have no inherent moral legitimacy. That was all uh, 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 by way of a footnote by, uh, in saying that we need to have, uh, think deeply about the trade-offs in, as we gauge in distribution, redistribution, but they are an expansion of some individual's freedom and a contraction of other individual's freedom. The next uh, to last point I want to raise is that uh, there are a number of cases where Restraints on freedom can actually expand freedoms, freedoms in a meaningful way. And the obvious example is a stoplight. It, it, you, it, it says you can, one person can go one way and the other person can go the other way. It's a, it's a, it's a loss of your freedom. Um, you, you aren't allowed to just willy-nilly go across the intersection. But here in New York, Without stoplights, you would have gridlock, and nobody could go anywhere. So that simple regulation, which is a restraint, actually expands all of our freedoms. Well, that's true for an awful lot of things, because without public investment in infrastructure, technology, education, we would be a much poorer country. Who, invent, who, who the spending on uh, that created the, uh, um, the internet or the mRNA platform that saved us uh, in, the, uh, in, in COVID-19, that was all financed by collective action, by government. So we have to admit that, you know, our freedom to act, we, wouldn't, we might not even be able to have, be free to have this meeting if it had not been for the mRNA platform that was a result of public investment. Were you paid by Pfizer? <laughs> was I paid by Pfizer? No. <laughs> so so uh, um, the, the, the point is that collective action can be individually freeing. And the final point is that, um, um, goes back to the point of endogenous preferences, and uh, the point that was made so, I thought, powerfully at uh, lunch today, 
is that it, to a large extent what our views are are shaped by those around us. You call it a kingship. But they actually shape what we, what we want, what our preferences are to use the language of economics. And um, in a way, that's an example of an externality. And if other people are selfish, you become more selfish. And uh, so as a good society, we have to um, uh, think about that. If we succeed in indoctrinating our children uh, to uh, not pollute or to eat uh, more vegetarian, uh, then we will have less need for regulations of, uh, concerning littering or, or polluting. So uh, the, the, um, endog- uh, the, the nature of our uh, societally formed preferences really interacts with the nature of the regulations that we need to, uh, and the extent to which those regulations are binding. Finally, I, I do want to mention, to come back to a liberal uh, arts education, I think a liberal arts education, one of the advantages of a liberal arts education is that it is free. It, it helps you understand uh, the forces that have shaped you and shaped our society and begins a un- lifelong inquiry uh, that gives you greater tools for uh, more agency. So that's just a, a, a self-serving advertising for what we do at Columbia and, and our other liberal arts uh, colleges. So let me now come to the second uh, part of the talk, um, and that is what kind of uh, economy creates uh, a good society? Well, it should be clear that uh, I think that uh, unfettered capitalism doesn't do that. Uh, the idea that capitalism without regulations uh, will deliver is absurd. Uh, um, and obviously, uh, um, it's not parade efficient. Um, uh, it, it, uh, one of the uh, major achievements, I think, of, of economics over the last 50 years is to show that even in narrow terms it fails, but even when we broaden the, our, our vision to include uh, the broader elements of a global society, uh, of a good society, it fails. And you can see it today in our, uh, um, in our, uh, um, so many aspects of what's happened in the United States and some other countries. Um, growth since the advent of neoliberal capitalism has been down. Um, inequality has been up. Life expectancy has been down. We've had the instability, the greatest uh, financial crisis uh, in uh, 80 years. Um, insecurity uh, is up. One of the question is, uh, that was posed by uh, what was uh, in the discussion today was uh, why if uh, things seemed you know, we're better off now than we were uh, 40 years ago, why are people so unhappy? One of the reasons is they feel a lot of insecurity. And one of the aspects of an economy marked by a lot of inequality is there are a lot of rungs of the ladder you can fall down, and they're very far apart. And uh, there is a, a, a sense of insecurity. Um, and it's, you know, one of the things uh, I think is palpable and documented uh, strongly. There was some reference, some, there, uh, some of the discussion today had more uh, optimistic view of what's happened uh, on inequality uh, than uh, I have. Uh, a few statistics, though, should re- help us uh, re- uh, keep in mind, besides the, the fact that uh, life expectancy is down, which is, I think, a good measure of, of, of well-being, uh, um, uh, uh, and health disparities between the richest of Americans and the poorest Americans are markedly up. But there are other things. Uh, the real wage of those at the bottom um, are at the, roughly the same level that they were 65 years ago. 
I mean, I think uh, that's amazing. We, you, you, uh, Parthur was giving all those statistics about what's happened over the last 70 years. And, and to say, you know, all that growth, all that uh, per capita income increasing, and yet in America, those at the bottom haven't shared uh, in that uh, increase. Um, and then we have to face the existential reality of climate change. Um, our market economy has not, you know, those, the data, that, that enormous growth has pretended that we have no planetary boundaries. And uh, the market has been worse than that because it's resisted the regulations that would protect us from, live, uh, would protect us from these excesses. The market has incentives to do that. If you're Exxon, you make money from polluting and you pay people to tell the world that there's no such thing as climate change. So, um, uh, we could go on about the other uh, failures, childhood diabetes crises, uh, but the climate change is the uh, existential crisis that we face. Um, and that, um, and then you think about, yes, uh, innovation and dynamism, it's great, but think about what is the business model of Silicon Valley, which has been such a source of innovation. It's building a better advertising engine to take advantage of you, you can say, well, to get you messages so you'll go spend more money to ruin the world a little bit more. But do you really believe that it is the most efficient way of spending our scarce R&D resources to have it focused on building a better advertising engine? Wouldn't it have been better to allocate, have a focus on saving the planet or than creating more unskilled unemployment? So uh, the, the uh, Final point, I know uh, Ned is coming up here and telling me I have to shut up. And so, so, uh, uh, we, <laughs> so the, 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 the final point I want to make about neoliberalism is I don't think it's a sustainable system. Ne neoliberal capitalism is not sustainable, not just because of the climate change, not just because it has this tendency to monopoly power, which has been documented, the increase in monopoly power has been well documented. Um, Adam Smith talked about it, but we are experiencing it. But also because it creates individuals who are untrustworthy. And you can't run a market economy with untrustworthy uh, individuals. So uh, uh, it is a system which will eventually devour itself. So we have to look for alternatives. Um, it, as I said, has to be decentralized. It has to be forms of capitalism. But it's what I would call progressive capitalism, democratic capitalism. Um, you can use the names are, are, uh, uh, are not so important. As uh, the notion that they have to involve a richer ecology of institutions, not just profit and uh, not, not just state and, and for profit, but uh, nonprofits. Columbia University as an example, cooperatives, um, NGOs. Um, and uh, I think there needs to be more dynamism in the creation of social institutions. So the problem, one of the problems with neoliberal capitalism was it said that we were at the end, we were in an equilibrium. We were the end of innovation from a social perspective. But we're in an evolutionary world where we're always, the world's always changing and we always have to adapt our institutions, our economy, our democracy, 
to those new situations and to those new, and that I think is, is why the word progressive, I like the word progressive, because it emphasizes uh, the fact that there's not an equilibrium here, but it's a, a uh, constant change in our society in an attempt, let me never get there, in an attempt to create the good society. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent.